Welcome to the Researching Practice, Introducing the Theory of Practice Architectures podcast. My name is Maureen Glenn, and I'm here with the originator of the Theory of Practice Architectures, Stephen Chemis. This is episode six of the series of podcasts, and it is entitled Practices Are Distributed. So, Stephen, are you going to tell us about how practices might be distributed? Yes, I'm going to tell you about how practices are distributed, Maureen. But before we, before we uh, begin, people might um, recall that last time we are talking about this theory of practice architectures and the table of invention down there on the left that you can use for analysing practice. And I said that that table can be used for describing practices, analysing them, critiquing them, and suggesting ways that we could transform them. And so that, that table has played a, a very big role in the research that we've been doing using the theory of practice, not only my immediate colleagues, but many other people too, over the, over the last um, dozen or more years. So this, this table, which, which gradually evolves, by the way, um, is nevertheless used by people to think about what a practice is made of, uh, how are sites, um, niches that support or don't support uh, practices. Sometimes I think of a practice as a, as a species. So your teaching is a kind of species. It's like a gazelle or something. And um, it, it requires a, a particular kind of habitat in order to survive. And it, it needs the conditions, it needs conditions survive, to survive. And so our practices are the same. They need particular kind of conditions to survive. Yeah. I was just, I'm thinking about, about, about this, this structure that you have here. And I'm wondering, as a, as a rookie researcher, somebody who's about to do a PhD maybe, how would they use this framework? How would they use it to help their study or to structure their study? Would you say at the very beginning, at the middle, at the end, or, or how would you see it practically being used? Well, <clears throat> people do find it at various stages in their PhD journey. Um, it, 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 it is easiest if, if you happen to have found it more at the beginning and don't have to change yes. later. Yes. But <clears throat> if you, if, if, first of all, if you want to study a practice, now let's say you're studying the principalship. Many people are not interested in studying the principal's practices. They want to understand about the principal's position the rules, roles, and all that sort of stuff, and 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 the trays of of charismatic leaders and non charismatic leaders, and so on. A lot of people want to study principles, not the practices of leading that they actually use. So we're interested in a practice perspective, looking at what leaders do, rather than you know, who they are, as it were. And a whole lot of the practice theory literature has been about who they are. Sorry, the leadership literature has been about who they are. So if you were wanting to study, if you, if you came to the idea early on that you wanted to study leading practices because you've been reading some of the leadership literature and you see that there's been that practice turn in the leadership literature, and people are beginning to talk about this. And if you happen to be lucky enough to uh, land on Shane Wilkinson's excellent book, Educational Leadership Through a Practice Lens, where she uses and helps to develop various ideas in the theory of practice architectures, particularly about um, the role of affect and emotions in practices. So if you're a leadership researcher, you come to Jane's book and you think, oh, I'll have a go with the theory of practice architectures. Well, this will help you to think about what kinds of practices do you want to study? 
what are those practices made of? Sayings, doings, and relatings. What holds them in place? And how malleable are they? And also, it helps you to think about where there are conflicts and contradictions and contestation about what leadership practices are. So, okay, I'm going to adopt the theory of practice architectures in my conceptual framework, my theoretical framework for the thesis. But now I use that table of invention and start thinking about practices and observing practices and maybe recording practices, um, you know, making videos of practices of some kind and thinking, how do I analyze them? What's being said, what's being done, how are people relating? And so you're thinking about the practice in those kinds of terms and the arrangements that hold them in place. And you're thinking, are those practices, are those um, arrangements holding them in deformed, disfigured kind of shapes that mean that leadership is too hierarchical, that these leading practices aren't helping this school uh, in, its, in its educational mission because the principal just wants to be the boss and seems to just want to strut about and tell people how much money and resources they can have and stuff like that and not be a, a facilitator of the, of the practices of the teachers, but to be the boss. And there are limits to that view of, of leadership. So some people in the leadership field have been studying things like what kind, what are the characteristics of distributed leadership? What are the characteristics of um, uh, uh, leadership that, that is democratic, leadership that is educational itself? You know, it's, uh, it's aimed at being educational um, or sometimes it's called pedagogical leadership. So if you want to look at these different kinds of practices of leadership, then you have to hunt them up in the field, go out there with your magnifying glass and find out where they appear and then start analyzing them. And so I think this, this table of invention helps you not only to describe practices, analyze what holds them in place, think, help you to think critically about it, uh, we didn't mean to be causing these untoward consequences. Somehow or other, the ways we're doing things are producing all these kids who are alienated from school. How, how do we do that? Well, what were we doing? That I mean, we intended to have everybody join in and be valued and cared about. But somehow or other, we've got this bunch of kids who hate school. How did they get there? They, they've misunderstood our good intentions. What, what made them fall out of the school? And if we want to take it seriously, we might want to transform what we do in order to welcome those kids, young people, whatever, back into the, into the, into the life of the, of the school. And that might mean changing many things. So you're talking, say in this example, you're talking about principles and leadership and and those kind of ideas you said a few moments ago that you know there's lots of stuff about the who the principal is as opposed to their sayings doings and relations and the architectures yes that put them that hold them in place um so i'm just wondering do you think that the that the person that the values that the human being behind all of the 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 principalship in a particular case their role isn't or their person isn't important it's very very important uh yes the person is very very important and i'm thinking about our friend jack whitehead and i as a living contradiction as he used to say i i think i'm being a positive facilitating caring welcoming teacher but somehow or other those kids escape my care and th th they're continuing to be difficult and you know if I'm in a secondary school maybe 
as soon as they can leave, they've gone. Um, and maybe before they can legally leave, they're, they're truanting because school is not for them because they don't see themselves in it and it doesn't see them in uh, its conventional life. So my values are really, really important, uh, who I am and, and what I want to be as a teacher. I, I'm sure you, you were never confronted by these things, uh, Maureen, but I, I remember often thinking when I was teaching educational theory in, in two undergraduates, for example, at Deakin University, I used to think, I wonder how many of these students uh, learn to hate educational theory because they're learning it from me. <laughs> but, the, the way I do it makes it so unpalatable, so incomprehensible that they just never want to hear it ever again, you know. And I remember Lawrence Stenhouse years ago saying uh, m many, many teachers uh, want to, to teach in an anti-racist and non-racist way, and yet they produce... 10% of kids who have racist attitudes, even though they're consciously teaching against race. Well, they're not the whole of those kids' lives, of course. But it's a big problem for the teacher to say, how am I complicit in that 10% ending up racist? Sure, there's a society out there, there's families and community out there that I can't control. But can't I do more? Isn't there something I can do to make this uh, uh, better. And so Lawrence Stenhouse invented the Humanities Curriculum Project to get young people talking about controversial issues in order to try and welcome them back. But he reckoned they still, 10% of the students still came out racist. So our values are one thing, but, and you know, our intentions and so on are important. They're not the only. They're not the only thing that controls the consequences, let alone the conduct of our practices. We think we're doing one thing, and in fact, we're doing another. I may be. I may be illustrating this principle even as I speak. <laughs> oh, okay, that's great. Thank you, Stephen. Okay, we're talking we move briefly on? about distributed practices. When we began in. Uh, episode two, talking about practices, we, we were often thinking that one view of practices was that they were the intentional actions of an individual person. But these, there are many kinds of practices that are act, actually distributed. So it's a single practice, but it has multiple participants. Now, for Shatsky, practices are necessarily the site of the social, they, that's the title of a 2002 book, is 2002 book. They are sites of human coexistence. We coexist in practices. So distributed practices, there are many, many, many of them. Pedagogical practices, teachers, teachers, and learning de learners developing their practices. Medical consultation practices, the doctor and the patient, practices of football, on and off the field. There are all these people who participate in the making of the football match. And I mean, I've only listed a tiny number of the people who are involved in that. So the practice is distributed and involves and coordinates and orchestrates a huge number of people. And as we saw from Andreas Reckwitz um, uh, in episode two, a practice also recruits people to it. So you come to be a football player, you come to be a, a, a referee, a spectator or whatever. And in distributed practices, participants become practice architectures for other participants, shaping the, the, the practices of other participants. Here is... Uh, a pedagogical practice going on, perhaps, 
in pedagogical practices, the sayings, doings, and writings of the teachers' practice may become practice architectures that shape the practices of students. And the sayings, doings, and writings of students' practices can become practice architectures shaping the practice of teachers. So here's a complicated picture trying to make this idea uh, um, simple, but of course, um, a picture is uh, worth at least 10,000 words. So the teacher's sayings are part of the practice architectures for the student, and the student's sayings are part of the practice architectures for the teacher. So the teacher is led to say something different in the light of what the student said, and so on. And the same in relation to the doings and the relatings. So the teacher is shaping the student, is shaping the teacher, is shaping the student, is shaping the teacher. And this is what teaching is. It's not a one-way street. It's not just transmission. It's a kind of interaction. It's a kind of practice in which people are interacting in the talk and interaction of the classroom, for example. So... And sorry, and Stephen, in that in that previous slide there, would you consider it like that the teacher and the student and the, stu the teacher and the student and all of those are within the practice architecture then of the school, within the practice yes. architecture of the school system or the Department of Education or whatever it is? Yep, the yep, yep. The, the practice, the teacher is only a part of the practice architectures for the student. There are thousands, you know, gravity the weather outside, it's a windy day. I mean, yeah, I mean, all of those, you know, it's Friday afternoon. I mean, all of those things are shaping what will go on in the classroom and the way that teachers and students interact. And, you know, I mean, windy days are notorious. I mean, um, for changing the way people behave in classrooms. So there are, there are a huge range of practice architectures that are shaping us. But the point is to try and find the interesting ones or ones that offer us insights into ways that we can understand and, and change, if necessary, our practices. When my friend uh, or friends, Christine Edwards Groves and Christina Davidson were studying dialogic pedagogies in uh, primary school classrooms uh, in a couple of locations in, in, in New South Wales and Australia. They took videos, or they had teachers take videos of their teaching. And the teachers are trying to create more dialogic pedagogies where their students talk more. And so Christine and Christina taught the teachers how to analyse uh, segments of classroom interaction, interesting moments using a kind of transcription called Jeffersonian notation. And so the teachers learned this way of doing Jeffersonian notation and they turn a transcription, a, a, a raw transcription of a bit of classroom behavior. They do a, this Jeffersonian uh, notation analysis because that analysis helped them to identify what they called the talk moves in the classroom. And the teachers could analyze it for themselves and they could find when they made certain kinds of talk moves, they prevented kids from saying more. And when they made other kinds of talk moves, responding to a question with a question, for example, they got the kids to say more. And also, if they controlled radially all of the talk in the classroom, the kids said less, but if they arranged things so that there were tables and pairs and other groupings of kids so they could talk to one another, then the kids would carry more of the talk in the classroom. So these teachers, by using this, uh, these videos and the Jeffersonian notation, were able to identify talk moves that would allow them to, to make students more active learners and make for more dialogic pedagogies. And so uh, this, kind of, this kind of way of looking at, at classroom talk and interaction 
can explore the ways teachers close down and open up opportunities for student uh, participation and learning. Great, Stephen, thank you. So just to underline the point from the previous time, in distributed practices, people are entangled with one another in intersubjective space, the space between us, a communal space that we all share. So it looks like Stephen is controlling this space. And in a way at the moment in this photograph, he may be, but you know that all of these other people will be having their say and changing what happens. And it will be happening in the intersubjective space that they share. Next time when practices become entangled, they can also become independent and begin to form ecologies of practices. And I wanna talk about that uh, next time. In this episode, we've been talking about these distributed practices that are single practices with multiple participants. Next time, I wanna talk about ecologies of practices that have multiple practices that are becoming interdependent. And we look forward to that. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you so much. Thank you for helping us to understand how we might use the theory of practice architectures to understand how practices are distributed. Thanks to everybody who's watching for joining us on episode six of Researching Practice, Introducing the Theory of Practice Architectures podcast with Stephen Kennis and me, Maureen Glenn. The next episode is episode seven, and it is entitled, as Stephen has said, Ecologies of Practice. You may access these podcasts via YouTube on the link below or at stephenchemist.com or at eari.ie. Looking forward to seeing you the next time. Goodbye. Goodbye.